situations that tug a war at me. All day long I struggle for answers that I
Father, help us now as we open your word, cause it may come alive in the heart of each hearer. For Jesus' sake, amen. A poor widow with five kids had no money for food. So every day she went on her front porch and she raised her hands to the heaven and she prayed out loud, Lord, you know I have no food in my cabinets to feed my five kids. Lord, would you please provide the food we need? So her next door neighbor, you know, he was an atheist. And after a while, he got sick and tired of this woman and all her religious talk. So one day he decided he was going to teach her a lesson. So he bought several bags of groceries, set them on her front porch, rang the doorbell, and then he hid in the bushes. The widow came out, saw the groceries, and she started praising the Lord. She raised her hands, thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer and for supplying my needs. As she said that, the atheist stepped from behind the bush and he arrogantly said, God didn't supply your needs. I did. He says it's foolish to trust in a non-existent God and give him credit for what I paid for. Without taking a breath, the lady continued into her prayer and she said, Dear God, you are so wonderful. You not only provided food for me today, you got the devil to pay for it. <laughs> Isn't it great to have a God who knows all we need? Amen? Isn't it great to have this type of a God? A God who can supply all our needs. A God who sees us. You know, in the chapter that we have before us, Hagar uses a name for God that only appears one time in the Bible. And in, your, in, your, in some of the versions, you may miss the name she uses because it has translated the name for you. But down there in verse number 13, Hagar actually uses the name El Roi, E L hyphenated ROI and the translators have inserted you are the God who sees. She uses the name of God El Roi. You see God has several names in the Bible and all these names help us to understand a little bit of who he is. If you're sick he's Jehovah Rapha. Amen. The God who heals. Sometimes we need Jehovah Rapha to touch us. Amen. Sometimes you're in need and we need Jehovah Jireh. The one who provides. Sometimes, all the time, we know we got problems with sin. Amen. And thank God we have Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord who is our righteousness. But this morning, we want to talk about El Roi, the God who sees. I'm talking this morning on the theme, you matter. God sees you. And I want in the next uh, several minutes, I want to share four lessons that we can get from today's text in the book of Genesis chapter 16. Lesson number one, and if, you, if, you, if you'll notice that we have notes in the bulletin so you can follow along if you care to. Lesson number one, since God sees me, I should wait on him. Since God sees me, I should wait on him. In Genesis chapter 16, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of God. Before they came to Canaan, God had promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation. And they were now 10 years in Canaan and Sarah still had no morning sickness. She, she, she had no cravings in the middle of the night for a cheesesteak. 
When we were having the first baby, can you imagine at 1 a.m. in the morning, my wife said, I need a cheesesteak, and I don't only need a cheesesteak, she says, I need it from whatever that place is on South Street. You know where we live. At that hour, I had to jump up and take her down to South Street so she could have this cheesesteak. Well, Sarah was not having that problem because Sarah was childless. This was not easy for a woman of that day because having an heir was very important and women who had no children were ridiculed because it is important to have had an heir. So a common practice was for a wife to give one of her maidservants to her husband. That was quite acceptable for a wife to give one of her servants to her husband to serve as a surrogate mother. It was socially acceptable. Sarah decided she'd take action, and she said, Abe, I need a baby. I need a baby real bad, so I want you to get together with Hagar so she can have a child for me. And Abram was only too happy to oblige. They couldn't wait on God. Waiting on God is hard, isn't it? We want a better job. A job becomes available that prevents us from having time for church or family. Oh, I know I'm talking to somebody this morning. A job becomes available that prevents us from having the time we need to worship God and for family. Without taking time to find out if this, God's, if this is God's will, we rush ahead. After all, why wait? In what area are you having trouble waiting on God? I am here this morning to say, since God sees you, you ought to wait on Him. Sometimes we're tempted to rush ahead because what we want to do is socially acceptable. And that's what happened perhaps with Sarah. What she wanted to do was socially acceptable and therefore it was easy for her to justify the action she was about to take because it was okay as far as the society was concerned. But I'm here to say social acceptance does not trump God's word. Amen? Social acceptance does not trump God's word. Sarah said, I've waited long enough, and society says it's okay, I can go again, I can go ahead. But society has no clue about the mind of God. You know, I got a stark reminder of this just uh, two days ago. I picked up Siri, and for those of you, I hope everybody knows what Siri is. Siri is the thing in, my, in your iPhone and my iPhone, all right? Siri will talk back to you, okay? So I said to Siri, I said, and I was being serious, I said, Siri, please give me the verse that we are the apple of God's eye. I was trying to get a shortcut preparation for the message, so I said, Siri could help me. Give me a verse. Siri, uh, that were the apple of God's eye. And Siri said to me, humans have religion, I just have silicon. <laughs> Can you imagine? Siri actually told me that. I'm not making it up. I was like, whoa, humans have religion, I just have silicon. And I said, my, my, my. Sometimes we go to the wrong place to hear about God's word. And sometimes that's what Christians do. If we're not careful, we want to hear what the society has to say rather than hearing what does God have to say. God is always right. Society says if you love each other and plan to get married, there's no need to wait until you're married to start living like husband and wife. Am I right about that? That's what's happening today. I was in a church this week and I was shocked. The pastor was recognizing some of his members. They were shacking up, uh, but he didn't really. Sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, no big deal that you're shacking up. But God's word has not changed. My Bible still says flee fornication. And young person, I want you to know God still says wait. Don't rush ahead. 
He doesn't care what the society says. He has not changed his mind. Society says if you're short on funds, why worry to wait on God to provide? Join the line and buy the, the lottery. And so the Christians were in the line. But you know, my Bible still talks about, God still warns us about the danger of trying to get rich quick. God's way is still a word beginning with W O R. Do you know the word? It's a word called work. And I thank God that he is able to supply all of my needs and he's able to supply your needs. And I'm suggesting to you, if you're under the sound of my voice, forget about the lottery. Trust God. I used to say to some of my clients, I said, listen, if you all ever saved up all that money you're playing on the lottery and invested that money, do you realize you'd have been a millionaire? Literally, I, I actually worked it out for them. I said, if you had invested all the money you play in the lottery, if you had invested it in mutual funds, by the time you get 55, 60, you'd have been a millionaire anyhow. Oh, let me leave that alone. But you see what I'm saying? Social acceptance does not trump God's word. But here's the other thing. Impatience with God has consequences. Amen? Impatience with God has consequences. So look with me in, in Genesis 16 verse 4. So he went in, Abraham went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said uh, to Abraham, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. Let me tell you a secret. God will not be horrid. Did you hear what I'm saying? God will not be hurried. He's not going to rush because you are in a hurry. I know it's tough when you're sick particularly. And I tell you one of the toughest things as a pastor is to visit individuals who are sick and have been sick for a while. And I realize that as much as I pray in faith believing, God, it's, he is on his own timetable. And I need to realize just because I am praying, it doesn't mean he is going to suddenly decide I'm going to have to hurry up because Brother Brian is praying. You see, when I was a kid, I would, you know, when we were in the class, we'd jump up. Because I want to make sure the teacher sees me and sees how urgent I need to be for them to come to me to get the right answer. Or so I believed. But I don't need to do that. You don't need to jump up and down. What God is saying here to you this morning, you don't need to do a thing. God sees you and he knows your situation. Let me share with you. Hold your finger in Genesis chapter 16, but turn with me to Psalm 27. And when you get there, say amen. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And if you get there, say amen. Amen. All right, we're going to go at verse 13. I would have lost heart, the psalmist said, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. 
Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And I want to hope that this, the Spirit of God will drive this home to everybody, whether you're young or you're old, that God will drive this home, that God is saying, wait on him. The psalmist said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And aren't, aren't you glad to know that you will see the goodness of the Lord that God has? has a, a plan for you. Amen? But if you refuse to wait, you should expect some consequences. Sarah's actions had consequences. Right here, we already see, uh, notice that it produced conflict between her and Abraham. You saw that? That although she was the one who told Abraham to go in and have a relationship with this lady, she immediately starts blaming Abraham. And, and then if you jump over to Genesis chapter 21, you see how it really, uh, the, the thing blossomed even more in Genesis chapter 21. Uh, verse number 9, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham scoffing, because now uh, 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 Isaac is born. Abraham and Sarah now have their own baby, and Sarah in verse 9 saw the son of Hagar, that's Ishmael, and verse 10, Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Abraham was grieved. But you see, this all, all of this was set up because of this impatience. But it didn't stop there. I need you to go somewhere else with me. In, in Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. I just want to read you one verse here. Genesis chapter 37 uh, and verse number 28. And here's what it says there. Then Midianites, this is when Joseph, Joseph was thrown in the pit by his brothers. Joseph, and if you remember, Joseph was the great grandson of Abraham. And here we have Joseph, the Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to Uhu. He sold him to the Ishmaelites, the descendants of Ishmael. Joseph, the great grandson of Abraham, is now being sold to Ishmael's descendants for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. And as you know, eventually what happened was that God's chosen people, Abraham's descendants, now ended up in Egypt for 400 years of hard slavery. All this was set up. I don't want you to miss this. All this was set up because Abraham and Sarah could not wait on God. The problem hasn't ended some of you know the Bible story very well that effectively Ishmael's descendants, uh, the, the, many scholars tell us that, that the Arab nations are the descendants of Ishmael and of course the Jews are the descendants of Isaac and the war continues. No wonder the Bible says he shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. When we decide we are not going to do it God's way, we cause trouble. We have serious consequences. I know I can tell you, I have met many ladies and men too, but a lot of ladies who decided not to wait on God's timing. God, did, There was no Christian man available, but they had to have a husband, so they grabbed a nice, clean-looking, ungodly man. Well, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. I, I, I've, over my years, I've seen the story repeat over and over and over and over and over again. And I want to tell you, it's disaster after disaster after disaster. And I'm suggesting to you young people and older ones, wait. Wait on God. We have too many ch children 
too many children who are born out of wedlock because some man would not wait. And you can control yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can wait. Amen? We don't have to go this route. So many children have experienced untold damage. Oh, I'm going to talk some more about the damage we have done to our children as we go through. But I am here to tell you, listen, when you decide you cannot wait, you cause trouble. It has consequences. What is it that you're rushing on today? Because there's somebody here in the audience that you are, uh, you are thinking of doing something, taking matters into your hands because you're just tired of waiting on God. May God help you to wait. Lesson number one, since God sees me, I should wait on him. But lesson number two, since God sees me, I must stand for righteousness. Since God sees me, I must stand for righteousness. What was up with Abraham? You read the, we, we, read the, we read the scriptures a couple of times already, so I won't, I won't reread verses 2 and 6. Why didn't Abraham take a stand? Why did he agree to sleep with Hagar? Oh, you've been following the series, and we know God made the promise in Genesis chapter 12. We know just last week. What happened last week? You can shout back at me, anybody who remembers. What happened last week? The Bible says that Abraham what? Be believed God. God says to Abraham, Abraham, step outside and look at the sky. He says, see if you can count the stars. And God says, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed God. And one chapter later, his wife says, why don't you have sex with this lady? He says, okay. And when she got pregnant, Come on now. Why did he allow her to be abused by his wife? He says to his wife, do whatever you want to do with her. Why didn't Abraham take a stand? Sadly, too often folks go along to get along. We fail to stand for righteousness. And I want to encourage those of you, some of you are in the workplace, some of you are in a high school, some of you are in universities, and God is calling on you, on me, on all of us to take a stand for righteousness. Our society is rapidly disintegrating. And more often than not, Christians are doing like Abraham. The Christians are gradually like Abraham, going along to get along. So the society can come up with all sorts of newfangled things and uh, your friends are discussing how wonderful these things are. And although you know these are contrary to the will and word of God, suddenly... You have a speaking problem. You have locked jaw. And God is saying, listen, don't be like Abraham. Because God sees me, I must stand for righteousness. Amen. I must stand. I want to talk to some of you dads. Because we have too many dads in our society who are like Abraham. Dads without a backbone. 
Dads who have no idea what's going on with their kids and who don't really care. Enough is enough. And God is speaking to some of you this morning and he is saying it is time for a change. It is time to stand for righteousness. It is time to guide your children in the path of righteousness. Amen. Some parents don't want, I'm talking to moms, it's not only the fathers. Because let's be honest, some, some families are raised by moms. Moms who, I just want to be her friend. You ever heard a mom say that? I just want to be her friend. You ain't her friend. You are her mother. That's the first responsibility you have. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you might become friends. In fact, I think my boys and I are very good friends. But it's not because I was trying to be their friends. Remember when my first son said he wants to come and work with me? My wife said, Brian, I don't know how that's going to work because the two of you knock heads so much. Listen, you see, there was a time he figured he's here. There was a time he figured, Dad don't know a thing. You know, there was a time he thought I knew something, but you know, kids get to a point where they figure, Dad don't know a thing. He is stuck in which year? I need to pray for Dad that he can get out the 60s or the 70s, you know. But I found out that after a while, I actually heard him telling somebody, you know, he, that actually makes some sense. <laughs> Do you realize that when you decide to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, when you decide to take the scripture and live it in your home and deal with them and discipline your, your children, even though they may cry. The Bible actually says if you give them a if you discipline them, they won't die. Did you know that? Oh, so, so, you say, but brother, society says, here we go again. Society says that you should just speak to them. I want to tell you, I'm so glad my mom, my daddy didn't just speak to me because I might have been in jail today, but my dad put the, the rod of education on the seat of learning. No, I'll be honest with you. I didn't intend to tell you this. I was a tough head. It was not, my brother is here, he'll tell you. It took them a long time to get me under control. As Richard will tell you, I'd, I, I would take the spanking and smile. <laughs> G give me, you, is, that, is that it? But you know, after a while, it adds up. And after a while, my father realized he could increase the dosage. <laughs> I, I'm, all I'm saying, parents, parents, do you know that almost all you need to, re to raise your children is in this book? Do, do, you know that this, do you know that this book is a book of wisdom? Do you know it's full of practical advice as to how to raise your children? And I am recommending to you, do it God's way. Don't worry about what Dr. Sue said or Dr. whatever said. Go with the book, amen? Number three, lesson number three. Since God sees me, I need, by the way, I'm not talking about child abuse. So don't you ever say I'm for child abuse. Never, ever. Don't grab that flying plan and hit that child in, in any part of his body. I said it to you before and I'll say it again. Never discipline a child while you're angry. Did you hear me? Abuse happens when you're mad. When you're mad, you grab the nearest whatever. No. And I, I want to tell you, it's even more, it's even more effective. So you sit the child down. Oh, I'm, I'm off. I better get to back on my message. Sit them down. Let them know I have to calm down. 
and let them know it's coming at such and such an hour. <laughs> let, let the steak marinate. Ah, let's just marinate. But don't, don't be one of them pretending dads are pretend. I'm going to get you. To, uh, come on. Bible says, let your yea be yea on your nay nay. If you told the kid it's coming, let it come. Let it rain. <laughs> Too much, I'm going to, and you do nothing. You realize, that I'm going to say to you, you are hurting your children when you do that. But this is not a message for about parenting. You are hurting your children when you say what you're going to do and you don't do it. You're showing how unreliable you are you're not showing how loving you are how unreliable you are so you better make sure before you say what you're going to do it is a reasonable thing that you intend to do lesson number three since God sees me I need not run away I better move on in Genesis chapter 16 verses 6 to 9 Abraham said to Sarah indeed your maid is in your hands do to her as you please verse number seven uh, uh, she fled. Sarah, um, Hagar fled. The angel of the Lord, in verse 7, found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord, by the way, many times in Old Testament when you see the angel of the Lord, it is actually talking about the Lord himself, as is very clear from this passage. The angel, particularly when it's an uppercase A, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply. Only God can multiply anybody's descendants. I will multiply your, des your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted uh, for multitude. Amen. It wasn't Hagar's idea to sleep with Abraham and have a baby, but she was the one suffering. Have you ever been so frustrated and hurt that you felt like running away? Is that where you are today? It could be because of a bad marriage. Do you know that sometimes married people feel like running away? It could be because you have a mean boss. Hagar decided to run away from everything, but in the middle of the desert, of the des desert, Hagar met God. And I want you to notice something here. God linked Hagar to what she was running from. Did you notice that in verse 8? God says, Hagar, Sarah's maid. Sometimes you think that if you run away, that's it. But God is linking her to the very thing she is running from. And I want you to realize that because in case you think when you have run away, you have really run away, God is going to link you with what you have run from. But second, I don't want you to miss what God said in verse number 9. God says what? Return and submit. Is God crazy? Does, does God understand what's going on here? God, you, you, the cattle on a thousand hills are your, yours. God, why don't you just give her a big endowment of cash so she can go back to Egypt and set herself up? God, is this the best answer you have for her? He says to her, return and submit. This was tough, particularly since Sarah probably hadn't changed. But you see, God was telling her this because he would help her face the challenges and he was really telling her, you can take it. 
Warren Wearsby, uh, who as a, it was a well-known Christian writer, author, uh, had done a lot of Bible commentaries. He was uh, on, um, on, uh, past the Moody Church and was a, the voice on back to the Bible broadcast. Warren Wearsby once said, life is 10% what you make it and 90% how you take it. Did you get that? Life is 10% what you make it and 90% how you take it. Now, I don't know if it's percentages, but you get the point. Hagar could either keep running or with God's help, she could go back and take it. I believe this message is for somebody here this morning. You know, sometimes kids feel like running away. One of my children who will remain unnamed to protect the innocent. <laughs> one, of, one of them, at one point, they were so angry, uh, they told my wife they were going to run away. And so my wife hurriedly packed a small suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably listening and said, what an abusive set of parents these are. My wife hurriedly packed a suitcase, took the suitcase, put it on the step and escorted that particular child on the step and let the screen door close. She left the screen door open, the door open so she could see what was going on. Do you know, do you think, do you th guess what the child did? The child didn't move an inch. <laughs> I am running away. The child has all the tools. You notice I'm protecting the sex of the child, the identity. The child had all the, it was necessary to run. Feet and a suitcase all packed. Listen, you know sometimes, and I'm talking to the kids now. You see, I try to cover everybody here. Some of you young people, you get so mad with your parents, you know. I want to run away. I want to. Kid, just remember your parents love you. They're the best thing you ever got. Other than eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. They're the best thing you ever got. So you need to get rid of that crazy thought in your mind. And in a sense, return and submit. Sub yes. Start obeying your parents. Rather than, I am. Obey. Oh, I, I hope somebody heard that. Obey, obey, obey. But there might be a husband or wife on the verge of splitting. You just can't take it anymore. But since God sees you, you need not run away. Because God sees you and he will help you rewrite a new story for your marriage amen is not what we preached on last night last week God can what rewrite your story and I'm here to tell you right now it seems so hopeless oh I'm just here to let you know my brothers and sisters we have had the joy of seeing people who are already divorced fall back in love and remarry by the power of the Almighty God and He can rewrite your story. So if you're here and you're, you're thinking of quitting or you're here and you've already quit, you're separated, you're divorced, as long as neither of you have remarried, the game can still be on. Once somebody is remarried, that's the end of that story. But I tell you, until then, God can rewrite that story. Uh, I know it's not going to be easy. You know, God doesn't necessarily, on our Sunday school class this morning, uh, Brother Jim spoke about the, the, the person building their house on the rock versus the person building their house on sand. And one of the points that was made, the person who builds their house on rock, it is hard to build on rock. But what security, what permanence, that house on the rock 
was able to withstand the storms that battered and buffeted it. And I'm here to tell you, my friend, that what God is asking you today is not easy. He has a way of not asking you to do the easy thing. He asks you to do the best thing. So I want to challenge you this morning. Return and submit. And I know for some cases it's going to take wisdom because if you're not exercising wisdom, you may make a bad situation worse. So make sure to seek Godly advice before you take action. But if God is speaking to you, you need to respond to God. Fourth, since God sees me, I have great value. Since God sees me, I have great value. Hagar was a woman in a male-dominated world. She was pregnant, used, rejected, and alone. And at the very moment she was at her lowliest point, loneliest point, that's when God showed up. Hagar was valuable to God. Socially, she was of little value. But she had met someone who valued her greatly. You know, I may be speaking this morning to someone who feels like Hagar. You've been so beaten up, you don't think you're worth much. But you're worth much to God. I don't want you to ever forget that. Because God sees you, you are valuable. You are worth much to him. Oh, I know there, there are people who, who have been abused in all sorts of ways. Some people, perhaps you're here this morning and you have been sexually abused as well. You have been physically abused. You may be emotionally abused. There's so much stuff that has gone down in your life that right now you are lacking in self-esteem. You feel broken. You feel messed up. Today, God says, I see you. You have value. You are valuable to me. Oh, I, as I was preparing, I thought of this verse, which we're going to put on the board to show, help you understand how much value you have. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 45 and 46. I'll put it on the screen. And the Word of God says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. You say, Pastor, who was that merchant? It's Jesus. Who is the pearl? Us. You. All your wretchedness, all the stuff in your background, all the stuff you have did, all the stuff people have done to you. It says, this merchant was searching for a pearl of great price. And it says when he found this pearl, he went and what? He sold everything. Isn't that what God did? Jesus, very God, stepped down from heaven to this earth because he was saying, you, and you, and you, and you are valuable to me. Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. You see, listen, the mess and the stuff people have done to you, sometimes we blame God. Don't blame God. What people have done to you just shows how awful and sinful the human heart is. And that's why that is what has separated us from God. The thing called sin. You've got it just as much as the person who abused you. And this is why sadly people who have been abused often become abusive themselves. Listen, because there's this thing in us called sin. What did God do? Jesus went to the cross of Calvary. He laid aside all his glory in heaven. He comes to the cross. He allows them to...
to beat him and to bruise him. And he hangs on the cross. He takes the full punishment your sin and my sin deserved. He took it all on the cross. And he's saying from the cross to you, I love you. You are valuable to me. You are so valuable that I am willing to die for you. And this morning, he's going to ask some of you to respond and say, God, if you love me so much, I want you to forgive me. I want you to cleanse me of my sin. I want you to come into my heart and into my life. God, I thank you that I am so valuable to you. God sees you. And because God sees you, you have value. So the question is, are you a part of his church? Are you a part of this pearl of great price that he purchased on the cross? If you're not a part of the church, if, you, if you're, listen, you need, you say, how do I come? Because we're not asking you to join this church. You see, becoming a part of the church happens when you establish a relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Hagar was so excited she used the name of God that does not appear anywhere else. She says, El Roi, the God who sees me. She got so excited. She named the well in his honor. Are you excited that God sees you? I close with a story. A boy in Burma, known Myanmar, was sent to a Christian school. The Christian schools uh, provided the best education, so his parents sent him there. And after a while, he began to question his faith in the gods of his parents. His, his dad, so his dad decided, you know what, I'm, I, better, I better take him to one of the magnificent temples to show him our gods. So his father took him to one of the largest Buddhist temples so he could see the gods at close range. And he showed him the images covered with gold ornaments and surrounded by flowers and candles. And then the dad said to him, look son, here is a god you can see. He said to his son, son, the Christians cannot show you their God, but here is one you can see. The little boy said, Dad, we can see this God, but he can't see me. He said, Dad, although we cannot see the Christian's God, he sees us all the time. I'm glad I have a God who sees me all the time. So no matter what you're going through, just remember, God sees you. Father, help us now. Lord, I believe by your spirit you have spoken to many hearts. Some need to come to Christ for salvation Others, Lord, have other issues that you want them to deal with. Oh, I pray that as we close this service, there might be some willing to do business with you, to respond to your voice today. Bless, we pray. Do your work for Christ's sake. Amen. Mm -hmm.